We'd like to believe that our kidneys flush gadolinium chelates out of our system very quickly, but in fact, the effects of gadolinium can last for several hours or days on subsequent MRI examinations. Here's a patient with an abnormality along the lateral aspect of his right thalamus. I'll go ahead and tell you that this is Listeria rhombencephalitis, and it's a cool case of Listeria, but that's not the point of our discussion today. Here's an image from the same patient 24 hours later. These are both flare images, but look at the CSF on the new sequence. It is diffusely abnormal. I should note that this patient is not receiving any supplemental oxygen at the time of imaging. Here are the post-contrast images from these same two examinations. This area of abnormal enhancement has massively increased. It's probably volumetrically 10 times as big as it was or, before, or more in just 24 hours. What could have caused such a dramatic change in such a small period of time? Here's the part where you should pause the lecture and see if you can figure out what's going on between these two examinations. Let's talk about the differential diagnosis for diffuse failure of flare suppression. Now, I like to call this a failure of flare suppression rather than bright flare signal because what's really happening is that the inversion pulse that's taking the bright T2 signal and suppressing that signal is failing to suppress the signal. So I prefer failure of suppression rather than bright signal because this intrinsically T2-aided sequence is supposed to have intrinsically bright signal. One thing that can cause a diffuse failure of flare suppression is a diffuse meningitis, a small amount of inflammatory proteins leaching into the CSF from the adjacent inflamed meninges are enough to cause the inversion pulse to fail. If you have a focal meningitis, you will get this focally, but if you have a diffuse meningitis, then you can get it diffusely. Subarachnoid hemorrhage, again, focal subarachnoid hemorrhage can cause a failure of flare suppression focally. Diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage, extensive subarachnoid hemorrhage does have the potential to do it diffusely. Carcinomatosis, if it's a focal carcinomatosis, it will cause a problem focally. If you have diffuse leptomeningeal carcinomatosis, small amounts of protein will leach out of the injured meninges and into the CSF and cause a failure of flare suppression. Famously, supplemental oxygen causes a diffuse failure of flare suppression, and that's why I noted in this patient that that wasn't the case, because it would have been a good choice in the differential diagnosis. There are a variety of artifacts that can cause a failure of flare suppression. If anything interferes with the underlying magnetic field, then the inversion pulse is going to be timed incorrectly for the magnetic field. Uh, f uh, this happens with dental amalgam that distorts the magnetic field. Usually that's a focal effect, though, and not a diffuse effect. And then there is the one that is often overlooked or forgotten, residual gadolinium. Gadolinium persists in our and leaks into our CSF for a few hours to a few days after its administration. Obviously, this becomes a problem in patients who are getting repeat MRIs set only a couple of days apart. It is a worse phenomenon in patients with renal failure. And in our example, it is diffuse, but if you have pathology in the meninges, this can be a focal phenomenon. Let's look again at this diffuse flare signal abnormality. These two studies are one day apart. That is critical. Theoretically, this patient could have suddenly gotten a rip-roaring meningitis, but this would be pretty quick, even for listeria. Now, this is an artifact of the gadolinium administration that occurred 24 hours earlier. There has been a slow leach of the gadolinium chelate into the CSF. Even from normal meninges, this can occur. This is not indicative of diffuse meningitis.
Well, what about the massive increase in enhancement? He probably did get a little worse in between these two studies. You can see there's some mass effect on the third ventricle, but he didn't get 10 times worse overnight. Again, this is seepage of gadolinium around the margins of the pathologic tissue. On a subsequent examination a few days later, it looked much better than this. It was definitely worse than it started, and in truth, he still has progressive disease even now, a month after his presentation, but it didn't look this bad and still doesn't look this bad even now. So remember, when you do multiple contrast-enhanced MRI examinations within a day or two of one another, you will get additional effects of the gadolinium that you gave a day or two before on your current examination, and that can confuse your interpretation. These effects can be local, if there is local pathology allowing seepage of gadolinium, or they can be diffuse even in the absence of pathologic meninges.